coming up on 2020 on ID. We wish you the best. A picture-perfect couple. It was awesome to marry her for a time and eternity. But their time together cut short. So now we're one. Oh, she's dead! He was calling to tell them that Janet was dead and she had committed suicide. We automatically knew that was not right. What would a second wife learn about the death of the first? That night I stayed up until about 4 o'clock in the morning. The mysterious death of Janet Abaroa. And... We open up with a big, joyful family. It was a house of love and peace and fun. Until Dad snapped. He picked out the two sharpest kitchen knives he could find. I just killed my two daughters. What could have driven him to murder? I think he's the biggest victim here. And how can his wife forgive him? Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Couples often think they know nearly everything about their spouses. But in the stories ahead, two different wives would find themselves caught off guard by the men they loved. First, college sweethearts starting their lives together, full of hope. But as I first reported in 2009, after Janet Abaroa was murdered, her family wondered if she had ever really known her husband at all. Sometimes when you meet someone, you just know it's love. Janet Christensen knew that the day she met Raven Abaroa at college in Virginia. She thought he was attractive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cute? Absolutely. Oh, yes. Definitely her type. She always talked about if they had any kids, they were going to be fantastic soccer players because both of them were. Janet grew up in a solid Mormon family, the seventh of ten siblings. Her sisters say she was so easy to get along with. A very sweet spirit. Say hi, hi. Loving, kind. She loved children. She had an opportunity to watch all of mine as they grew up. It's not just that she loved them. I mean, they all gravitate towards her. They loved her. Janet was also a natural athlete and went on to play soccer at Southern Virginia University. She already had a boyfriend, but Raven Abaroa swept her off her feet. And it seems Raven was smitten too. She was beautiful, attractive. I just felt so much comfort when I was with her and we just started this journey of getting to know each other that was just, it was amazing. What would she say about him? She was just infatuated. I mean, see, he has this going for him. He's, uh, he's going to be successful. He tried very hard to make everybody believe he had the perfect life. Janet was convinced that Raven had that perfect life. And two years later, they married at the Mormon Temple in Washington, D.C. It was awesome to be able to kneel across from her and, and marry her for a time and eternity. The Abaroas settled in southeastern Virginia, where Tim Dowd and his family were their neighbors. We were just part of a big family. They both came from big families, and they didn't have any family in the immediate area, so we, they kind of adopted us and hung out at our house a lot. Hey, everybody. Merry Christmas. Um, On their Christmas video card to their families, Bye. the Abaroas seem like the perfect, happy today. couple. We wish you the best and the warmest feelings this holiday season. Janet, what would you like to say? I would like to say Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Life was looking good for Janet and Raven. Yeah, he appeared to have his act together. I mean, he was young, newly married, had bought their first home. You know, had a couple nice cars, you know, and a motorcycle, and like, wow, this guy's kind of off to a pretty fast start. They both get jobs with a big sporting goods company, and the couple moves to Durham, North Carolina. It should have been the happiest time of their lives. But then her sisters say Raven confesses to Janet that he's been sleeping with other women. He came to her one day because he wanted to be out of the marriage and explained to her that he had been cheating on her with several different people. And very soon after that, she found out she was pregnant. She didn't know what to do. She didn't want to raise the baby as a single mother. She thought who she was married to was someone completely different. And despite finding out that he was somebody completely different, still being torn whether to stay with him and be with him because she had made that commitment to him she and to God. 
In the spring of 2004, two and a half years into the marriage, Janet asks the Dowds if she can visit them for a few days. We said, sure, come on up. You, you could tell she wanted, she needed somewhere to go. She was crying, very distraught, and she told me she loved Raven and that she didn't want to have this child by herself. She loved him, she wanted him back, but not, not under the conditions with, with, when he left. Tim agrees to talk to Raven. After all, he sees him almost like a son. And I kind of read him the riot act in a major way. You know, what the hell do you think you're doing? You're married, your wife is pregnant, you need to grow up real quick. Oh, he promised, swore up and down, that uh, he would no longer cheat on her, that she was the only one for him, he would make it work. On October 17, 2004, Janet gives birth to a son, Caden. Raven appears to be a great dad and is in awe of his son. But then another blow. Raven is caught stealing from his job and is fired. Co-workers say Janet is so embarrassed that she resigns, but she doesn't give up on Raven. He would eventually plead guilty to five charges of embezzlement, but he's able to avoid serving time in jail. Raven finds a new job with a computer company, and the marriage seems to be on the mend. <laughs> it's the evening of April 26, 2005. Janet is doing the laundry, and Raven is working in the house. We looked at Caden sleeping, made sure everything was good with him, and put our arms around each other and, and you know, said, I really love you. Then Raven says he goes off to play soccer. He returns home that night at about 10.45, and that's when he says he makes a horrifying discovery. I'd always go in and give Kid a kiss and just feel his warm little body. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's when I found out that something wasn't wrong. Stay with us. The marriage of Janet and Raven Abaroa looked rosy at the start, but only two years later, it was beginning to unravel. Still, nothing could prepare Janet's family for the horrifying news they were about to receive. It's five o'clock in the morning when Janet's parents get a phone call from Raven. He was calling to tell them that Janet was dead and she had committed suicide. She had killed herself with a gun which we automatically knew that was not right. She wouldn't have done that. She wouldn't have done that to Katie. No, she would have never killed herself, ever. We knew that wasn't true. In fact, police quickly realized that Janet has been murdered and not with a gun. She'd been stabbed to death. An autopsy later showed she was pregnant. The police knew that it wasn't a suicide and that it wasn't a gun. They knew that it was a knife they were looking for. When they yellow taped that house and were searching the house, they were looking for a knife. But at Janet's funeral, everyone puts their questions aside to watch this loving tribute played for her family and close friends. Home movies of this young mother cuddling her baby boy. Raven was inconsolable crying all the time, falling apart. I was mourning the loss of my best friend and of my wife and of Caden's mom. And it was, that in and of itself, it was so much pain that that was, it was hard to deal with every day. Janet Eberoa was found inside her fair and drive home last with what appeared to be a stab wound in her chest. Durham police have not named any suspects, but will only say her murder was not random. We're looking for anybody with any information on this case to call us. Raven knew that he didn't want to raise his young son on his own. In an interview with the TV show North Carolina Wanted, he talked about what it's like for Caden to be without his mother. 
And I think it's wonderful that he knows his mom. He knows her name. I try to share the things that his mom does so that he appreciates those two pictures of her graduating from college. When, you know, the question comes, well, where is mommy? You know, she's in heaven looking down at you. She's, she's playing soccer in heaven. She's watching you. Just a few weeks after his wife's murder, Raven decides to take his son and move west to Salt Lake City, where he grew up, to live close to his Mormon family. But North Carolina is not the kind of place where unsolved murders sit quietly. Raven provided cooperation at the beginning of the investigation, but there have been subsequent requests for interviews that have gone unanswered. I kept talking to Raven about, you've got to help solve this case. I mean, personally, my thought is if somebody were, murders my wife or a child or any close family member of mine, I'm banging on the police door saying, what have you done lately? Raven did nothing. Within a week, he left and never came back, with the exception of sneaking into town once to pick up his furniture, and he left. Raven, meanwhile, has turned to a new chapter in his life in the Salt Lake City suburb of Jordan. He starts working at this bicycle shop, but his employer says he again is fired for stealing. But then, two and a half years after the death of his first wife, <laughs> Raven meets Vanessa Pond, a single mother whose daughter, Aria, is in the same daycare as Raven's son, Caden. But Vanessa, according to her father, is definitely not interested in starting any romance. I used to jokingly refer to her as the uh, president of the man-haters club. But sometimes when you meet someone, you just know it. And soon after Vanessa meets Raven Abaroa, she's in love. What was it about him that you liked? He seemed very upfront, very honest and genuine. And um, I found out that, you know, he was a single father. And I really, really admired that. I'd been a single mom for five years. I know what it takes to raise a child. I thought, you know, maybe I'll give him a chance because he could be a fantastic father, fantastic husband. So I, he might be. I finally fell for the, the nice guy is what I thought. Did he mention his ex-wife or what happened to her? Yes, yes. Um, as we were just starting to date, uh, he, he just mentioned that my wife actually died. And so that I immediately felt so sorry for him and Caden and to take them in and give them all the love that they're missing out on. Did he say she was murdered? He said that there was an intruder um, and that and that she was killed and that he'd found her and he left it at that. And so did Vanessa, that is until she started researching Janet's murder on the internet. That night I stayed up until about four o'clock in the morning reading blogs, watching his interviews, reading all the news stories about it and um, going out of my mind. Thinking what? I thought, you know, there's no way, there's no way. And I watched, I remember watching the interview and I wasn't convinced. That he was innocent? That he was innocent. I felt that in the interview, there was a, uh, a part where they asked him, you know, what he saw, what he came home to. I don't like talking about what happened to her. And it's not because I don't love her, and it's not because I don't want to find out who did it, but... It's because I have so many good memories with her that, you know, I hate thinking about the, the bad times, you know. For me, I just honestly, I cannot even come to, to relive all those moments again. And, you know, even today when I've been prepping for weeks to come talk about it, it's so hard to, to even want to say, you know, I this is what I saw because it's not something I want to see again, ever. And uh, that's how I learned that she was stabbed. So I went over and uh, I spoke with him, asked him the questions that I had, and he removed any and every doubt from my mind. Raven may have been able to convince his new girlfriend, but back in North Carolina, Janet's family and friends had many theories about what happened to Janet. And they say all their suspicions pointed toward Raven. 
I knew he killed her the morning I found out, the exact second. There was no doubt in my mind. And my instantaneous nanosecond reaction was, oh my God, Raven has killed Janet. And they wonder, if this was a break-in, why was Janet's jewelry left behind? Her wedding rings were on the counter, right where the supposed break-in happened, where the door was left ajar, sitting right there. Nothing else was missing except his laptop and the knives. The knives. As it turns out, Raven was very proud of his knife collection. Remember that Christmas video? Well, with Janet in the background, Raven brags about the special knife he's bought for himself. That's my new knife got for Christmas. Thank you. Bought it myself. My dad would be very proud. I like to collect knives. Janet didn't think much of it at the time when Raven took out a life insurance policy for each of them when she became pregnant. After all, parents often buy policies when they have a child on the way. But now, her family and friends find it suspicious. He had taken out a life insurance policy soon after she got, you know, she found out she was pregnant with Caden. How much was the policy? 500000 on her. Is he capable of doing that, doing it for the insurance money? Absolutely. The Abaroa's old neighbor, Tim Dowd, has pondered and studied every detail of the case. Everything points back to Raven. But 2,000 miles away in Utah, Raven's new girlfriend, Vanessa, is convinced this poor, grieving widower needs to be loved and cared for. He started talking about me moving in after uh, probably just a few weeks. And that was very, very fast for me, especially since I had my daughter to think about. And I told him that I wouldn't be moving in with anybody if I wasn't at least engaged to them, knowing that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with them. Vanessa is unaware of the extent of the suspicions of Janet's family and friends. Were you worried that this might be a mistake? I didn't have a question in my mind at the time. We'll be right back. Young mother Janet Abaroa has been stabbed to death, and her siblings suspect Janet's husband, Raven, had something to do with the murder. Meanwhile, Raven has started a new life out west and fallen in love again. Can he bury the past, or will it follow him? Nearly three years after the murder of his first wife, Raven Abaroa asks Vanessa Pond to marry him. But Vanessa's father, a former police officer, has a cop's hunch and a father's instinct. The Christian side of me wants to believe that he's innocent until proven guilty. The, uh, the police officer side of me says there's, there's, uh, there's something wrong with this picture somewhere. So, as concerned parents, they have a candid discussion with the man their daughter has fallen in love with. They asked him if he had had anything to do with his wife's death. His response was, uh, he kind of sidestepped the question. and He didn't say, yes, I did it, or no, I didn't do it. He said, I loved my wife. I loved her so much. Which insinuates that he didn't do it, but he didn't come right out and say that he didn't. And he was in tears, and um, she went over and put her arm around him to console him and comfort him. She says, no, I'm, I, I know the guy by now, and I, I'm really convinced that he's, he's not uh, guilty of this. At the end of it, they still had their reservations, but soon after that, Raven asked my dad for my hand in marriage. Vanessa and Raven have a beautiful wedding in her parents' backyard. As they leave for their honeymoon, Vanessa's mom gives her a kiss and Raven a message. Just take good care of my little girl. He promised me he would. But then, on one of the nights of their Las Vegas honeymoon, Vanessa says Raven tells her something she still wonders about to this very day. Then he started talking about Janet and how mad he was after she died. Not how sad, not how heartbroken, just mad. At whom? Just that she was dead.
And then he cuddled up closer to me. And he said, I promise I'll never hurt you. I didn't know what to think about that or how to feel about that. It scared me. How'd it go? <laughs> when Janet's sisters learn Raven has remarried, they feel the duty to talk to his new wife, Vanessa, and they have a dire message. We just wanted her to make sure she was aware of things that had been in the news about him, that she would know what she was getting into and that we were fearful for her. I was heartbroken. I did not want to believe at all that he had done this. And she says Raven was beginning to act in ways she just couldn't understand. Within moments, he could switch. He could say the most horrible things I was an effing whore, a lot, an effing B word. And that one thing you never call a woman, that C word. And then moments later, you would apologize. I'm sorry, I was just mad. That's just what I say when I'm mad. That's just what I do. And Vanessa says the abuse became physical. He grabbed me from the door and uh, threw me up against the wall. And then I fell. Later, he tried to convince me that I had tripped. He began to call my own family and my own friends and my coworkers, telling them that I was horribly depressed and bipolar and um, that I probably needed to be institutionalized. It got really bad. Vanessa says she becomes more and more frightened for her safety and begins making plans to leave Raven. But her parents say she's trying to hide it from everyone. She can put on a really good front for being happy. Um, and I think that she was pulling every resource she had within herself to give that illusion of happiness in her marriage. It was the, the week before Thanksgiving, I think it was, when she came to us and, and then told us the ugliness of it all and felt she needed to get out of it. Finally, the day before Christmas, everything comes to a head as they're getting ready to go to Vanessa's parents' house for dinner. On Christmas Eve, he had me backed into the corner and he was screaming at me. And I began poking me in the chest, just yelling at me. I ended up with bruises on my chest from him. He started gathering his things. Are you glad you let him go Christmas Eve? It would have only become worse. Raven has denied he was ever physically abusive to Vanessa. But she remains convinced that Raven walked out that night because he wanted to tell his family and friends that it was Vanessa who was unstable and suicidal. All part of a plan, she says, to make it look like Vanessa might kill herself. I think he was in the process of setting it up with family and friends that I'm suicidal. After seeing the Jekyll and Hyde that I lived with. His, his eyes would just change. It was very scary. Because you didn't know what to expect. It's one thing to be abusive verbally and physically. But you think he's a murderer? Yeah. Yes, I do. We have a substantial amount of circumstantial evidence. It's, um, but we're looking for, for something that we believe will provide us with enough information to go to a jury and prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We would obviously like to talk to Raven. 
we have some questions we'd like to ask. The only public comment Raven has made regarding his wife's murder was in that North Carolina Wanted TV interview. The bottom line is that I wasn't involved with the death of my wife, that I would do anything in the world to keep her here with me, and that's just, you know, that's something that I know, that's something that Janet knows, and, and that's something that I think that people who truly know Janet, truly know me, can understand and appreciate. But the women who say they knew Janet better than anyone, her sisters, remain convinced that Raven was somehow involved in Janet's murder. He hasn't done anything to prove otherwise. Mm -hmm. He hasn't helped the police. He hasn't sat down and with the police. He hasn't like set out a reward, help me find my wife's killer. And if he didn't do it, he needs to step up to the plate and take the lie detector test and talk to the detectives and cooperate so that at least they can rule him out and move on. Five years after Janet's death, Raven Abaroa was extradited to North Carolina and charged with her murder. While his first trial ended in a hung jury, in March 2014, he was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter after entering an Alford plea. And that means the defendant does not admit guilt, but does acknowledge that the evidence would probably have resulted in a conviction. Abaroa was sentenced to eight to ten years in prison. Vanessa Pond's marriage to Raven was annulled. When we return, a loving father on the edge. One day you go from I'm functioning to I'm not functioning. And his children's lives on the line. He said he picked out the two biggest and sharpest kitchen knives he could find, and he knew how well they would cut. Stay with us. David Crespi loved his children, but even so, a shocking act of violence would change his family forever. And as Jim Avila first reported in 2008, it would also test the limits of a wife's faith and love. It was a grand house on a pleasant suburban street. There's a tree, Christmas, and death. Hi. How are you? Good. Good morning, Merry Christmas. Good morning, Merry Christmas. Cass, say hi. Hi. We open up with yes, yes, yes. Filled with children, laughter, and a pair of adoring parents. Dylan, Josh, where's Jeff? It was a house of love. It was a house of love and peace and fun. I had the American dream. I had a beautiful home with great neighbors and friends. I was senior vice president for a Fortune 100 company. The time with my kids, that was just wonderful. Most of all, my wife was just incredible. David and Kim were married two years after his first wife died of brain cancer, leaving him with two small children. And their family grew quickly, five Crespi kids in all, as Kim gave birth to a son, and then four years later, their pride and joy, the final happy addition to their family, identical twins, Tessera and Samantha. And Tess and Sam were precious to us. They were incredible. They were a gift. We just were so thrilled to have him. He adored them. I adored them. Our children adored them. They brought so much joy to all of us. The Crespi family seemed to have everything, including a disturbing secret about David that threatened to destroy it all. One day, you go from I'm functioning to I'm not functioning. Then your mind lies to you and says, no, this is not going to end. This is... This is all there is. David Crespi suffered crippling bouts of depression that began in his late 20s. Dave is a really intense person, very bright, goes from A to Z. When we were getting married, I didn't really know that he could possibly have a severe mental disorder. He was still sweet, he was still loving, but he would just be kind of in another world. I take him to therapy, we talk with the therapist about him trying to get back into the game. Getting back into the game at his high-stakes job was not always so easy. David often missed work, but Crespi, who was a vice president at a major bank, says his co-workers enabled him, excusing his dark days. If you're a senior executive officer, you don't punch a clock. 
Um, so you crawl into work at 10 o'clock. People cover for you. So you were successful enough, valuable enough to the company that they looked the other way during those periods? Just get better. We know you'll get better. Um, and the good intentions. At his lowest moments, the disease made Crespi, a devout Catholic, consider committing a mortal sin. I was suicidal. I attempted to take my own life from a car in the garage, I'm running a car in the garage, hung off a bridge in California. How many times do you think you tried to commit suicide? Four, about four or five times. He promised he wouldn't commit suicide. He you? wouldn't kill himself. And he goes, I won't do that. It's not my faith. It's not what I believe. It's not who I am. I did promise her that I wouldn't do it. But again, I was reasoning with an impaired, unstable mind isn't something where people can take that to the bank and rely on it. Happy birthday to you. That promise did not stop the dark, dangerous thoughts. It just changed the focus to a new, different target. I thought about killing other people. Were your thoughts about hurting strangers or your family members? Family members. There were just people in, in, that were around me. Were they detailed thoughts or were they just sort of random? They were rational, random, crazy thoughts that horrify me. And did you tell your therapist about those? No. Did you tell your wife about those thoughts? No. So you kept those to yourself? Because I didn't think they were real. He's not able to engage with people. He's being very antisocial. He's saying, I'm going to lose my job. I'm, we're in financial ruin. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't think those things are true. Kim took her husband to see his psychiatrist, who she says told Crespi he was, quote, catastrophizing. He recommended antidepressants, but Crespi complained that the Paxil he had previously been prescribed caused him to gain too much weight. So he says his doctor switched him to another antidepressant, a move that the Crespi's claim would prove disastrous. When people are started on medication, monitoring is essential because their mood may become quite changeable as the medication kicks in. Clinical psychiatrist Maria Okendo. Is that a dangerous period of time? Anytime you introduce new medication, it's a little bit dangerous. How dangerous would become devastatingly clear. Just one week after starting his new medication, and only one day after visiting his therapist, David Crespi's catastrophic thoughts became frighteningly real. It's, it's hard for, for me and anyone who grows up in this society where we think you, you're the master of your destiny and you control your own thoughts. Well, there's a part of the mind where you don't. This is not his character. So this is not the Dave Crespi you knew and loved? This isn't the Dave Crespi you know today. This is the Dave Crespi of that moment, impaired um, by medication, by a misdiagnosis, by no monitoring, by psychosis, and Tess and Sam are in the wrong place. Stay with me. Bank executive David Crespi was on the edge. He was having dark thoughts and had attempted suicide. So far, he hadn't harmed himself or others, but that was about to change. With the chilling conclusion of our story, Jim Avila. In January 2006, David Crespi was again suffering a bout of deep depression. Unable to work, the happy life he and his wife Kim had built over the last 10 years was about to tragically crumble. David was at home with his wife and their five-year-old twins. Kim ran out to get her hair done, and the girls asked him to play. For David Crespi, the scene had been set. We were playing a game. We were playing uh, hide and seek, and it just came to me that, that there is no future. There is, no, there is nothing, and this was all set up as a sign. Um, Kim left to get her hair done. And that's the way it's all aligned for, the, for them to die. While the kids were hiding around the house, immersed in hide-and-seek, David Crespi took knives from the kitchen cabinet. I stabbed them, but I never saw them. I held them down and made sure that they were not facing me. After murdering his daughters, Crespi matter-of-factly changed his clothes and grabbed his car keys in order, he says, 
to drive off and commit suicide. And then I remembered that I couldn't kill myself because I promised Kim I wouldn't. That's when David said he heard a voice coming from the sprinklers on his front lawn. It was saying, you have to call someone. You have to call 911. Police department? Yes. I just killed my two daughters. You just what? I just killed my two daughters. He said he picked out the two biggest and sharpest kitchen knives he could find, and he knew how well they would cut. Are they breathing or anything now? They're dead. What did you do to them? I stabbed them. You stabbed them? Yeah. How many times did you stab them? I don't, I don't know. Sam was found downstairs in the kitchen. She had 18 stab wounds. One of the stab wounds, the knife was still in, still in her chest. Officers ran upstairs and found Tess in the master bathroom, and she had 14 stab wounds. They're dead. How, how long ago did this happen? 15 minutes. Well, there still might be some time we still might be able to help them. No, they're bleeding. They're dead. I have seen a lot of horrible things, but there is something about the murder of a child. And to see the murder of two children that are identical twins, it's like mirror images of murder. Crespi was arrested, taken to jail, and placed on a suicide watch. Prison psychologists examined him and concluded that he suffered from a serious mental illness, not simple depression, but the much more dangerous bipolar disorder, sometimes known as manic depression. There are situations in which the person can have both symptoms of depression and symptoms of mania at the same time. Those are very, very dangerous because the person often has the energy of mania and the despondency of depression. And that can be a fatal combination. David Crespi, who was charged with stabbing the girls to death. And at first, it was just local news, a tragic story of a father taking the life of his children. It became a national whisper campaign when Kim Crespi did what you could never imagine a mother doing. The battle of mental illness raged, and the most innocent members of our family are lost to this life. She continued their marriage and love affair in weekly visits to prison, blaming everyone but him. Kim Crespi forgave the husband who killed her kids. How are you? Good to see you. Mm. You're good. How can I forgive him? It's grace. It's, but it's also a choice. I don't have any regrets. I married my soulmate. I'm still married to my soulmate. And Dave needs me. So there's lots of reasons to get up in the morning and see what God has for us, you know? Are you amazed that she could forgive you? What did she tell you? I, I can't remember the exact words, but I, I just remember the love. <laughs> and, and I just remember her sorrow for them and her sorrow for me. And uh, I remember uh, just being uh, awestruck by that. Why can't you just turn your back on Dave? Uh, why would I? Because he killed our girls. I, I think he's the biggest victim here. Sam and Tess are gone, but they're in heaven, and I believe heaven is so <coughs> glorious that I wouldn't want them back for one minute for them. They're fine. We're not. Dave, especially not. Kim Crespi blames the death of her children and David's predicament on psychiatrists and therapists who she says missed a critical diagnosis, finding in his dark moods depression and not the more serious bipolar symptoms. One of the things that makes it difficult to diagnose bipolar disorder is that usually when the person is euphoric, you can imagine that they're not that interested in treatment because they feel good. And they present for treatment usually when they are depressed, when they feel terrible. And it often takes a lot of uncovering to figure out that it's a bipolar disorder. According to a study conducted in 2001, it takes patients an average of 10 years and four different psychiatrists to arrive at a bipolar diagnosis. David Crespi says that's what happened in his case. And at what point did you start to think or did others start to think that this was more than depression, that this may be manic depression or bipolar? Um, it wasn't until I came to prison. I mean, the best, the best psychiatric care I've gotten in my life has been in this prison.
Crespi believes that success blinds. His big house in the suburbs, the big job in the skyscraper, perfect family, no drug problems, all fooled doctors and therapists who may have overlooked his bipolar symptoms. When you're in a, a $1,200 Hickey Freeman suit uh, uh, and, and you, you tell them what you do for a living, that to some of them could be intimidating. Crespi has traded in forever his three-piece suit for a prison-issued uniform, and the antidepressants have been replaced by the more powerful lithium for his bipolar disorder. Are the dark thoughts gone? Oh, yeah, totally. I haven't been depressed since I came to prison because I've been correctly medicated. It's a blessing. People that say that he's fine now and he's fixed, they all thought he was fine then. Nobody saw this coming. The only person that saw it coming is David Crespi. Prosecutor Marsha Goodenow believes that circumstances would have been very different if Crespi had been honest with his psychiatrist from the beginning. He never told them what he wanted to do to his family, but then wants to say that the system has failed him because he wasn't properly diagnosed. He alone could have stopped what he did to his family if he had just told somebody what he was thinking or feeling. Crespi avoided a trial by pleading guilty to two counts of first-degree murder. The former bank vice president is living his life sentence without the possibility of parole in an 8 by 12 prison cell in North Carolina, where he keeps pictures of his slain twin daughters on his wall. I loved him dearly, and uh, I miss him. And um, my life and the lives of all the people I love will never be the same. Except for Kim's Saturday visits, David Crespi is virtually alone, a man blessed by the forgiveness of his family, but cursed by the ironic clarity his new medicine gives him, allowing him to be forever haunted by those images that line his cell.